Right, that's that. Um, so thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, by the sound of it, most of you do know David, so he, he's not going to take much introduction um, when the time comes. Um, just to introduce myself, so um, myself and Neil Thornton, who's, who's joined us at the moment, he's live from, from work. Um, we set up Barn Fawn uh, towards the end of last year. Um, we've currently got about about 30 odd authors uh, signed up to work with us, um, varying kind of states of uh, publishing their books. Uh, some are ready to go now, some are going to be 18 months uh, down the line. So we've got some exciting stuff coming. Um, although a lot of our books are military history um, in nature, that just reflects uh, the kind of background of myself and, and Neil. Uh, but such as David's book, um, we are interested in, in any genre um, and we're not, we're not going to be kind of boxed in, as it were. Um, so that's Barn Fawn. Um, as we said at the start, if you, know, if you have, have any idea for a book, uh, feel free to, to talk to David, kind of sound it out with David, uh, or indeed come directly to us and, and we can see if it's something we can help you with. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to give David the chance to introduce himself, um, bearing in mind this could go out to a, um, an external audience, so they might That's not know you, boring. David. Yeah, so um, David Gray, um, on Facebook I've changed my name because as you probably know, those of you who were in the military, 144 David Greys were killed at the Battle of the Somme and people couldn't find me. So uh, I'm now Priscilla Jamaica. No, no, I'm not. I'm uh, Dark Pilgrim on Facebook and uh, copy of the book. I don't know why I've picked that up yet. You've not got queued. <laughs> um, so I'm an interfaith minister. I was a Church of England minister for a number of years, had previously worked for the Catholic Church, but I've always worked um, with Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, etc., etc., um, and with the Humanist Society, who actually send uh, funerals my way. So my key role in life at this moment in time is as a funeral celebrant and uh, a wedding celebrant um that, that's it you'll find out a bit more i guess along the way definitely i think you've been being quite modest so as you say we'll we'll, we'll get through a lot um <laughs> so so talk, talk to us firstly about about the book so how did that how did that come into being uh what was the kind of your idea behind uh writing it well i think it, to be honest uh mo like most people have a book in them uh, probably all people have a book in them, whether it's for them to write or for somebody else to write. Um, and for a long, long time, I've wanted to try and find a way to kind of ventilate some of the issues around um, wounded healers and um, the, the, the very, very important role, I believe, that they play in society. Um, particularly, of course, I wanted to ventilate some of my own negative experiences um, along my journey. Um, but I always want to put a positive spin on things. So, um, you know, the wounded healer bit is is such a powerful um, way of of saying to anybody who is going through some kind of a difficult situation. It could be addiction. It could be a soldier with PTSD, a homeless person, etc. Um, that actually you're being skilled up for something in the future. You can get through this, and when you get through this, you will be such an asset to the rest of society. Yeah, and I think I think what you said there is kind of echoes with the, the cover of the book really because that that's been born through you know sort of kind of trauma um I mean, i'll show it on screen now i think most of you oh, have thank seen you. it um but do you want do you want to just give us the kind of the backstory as to to, to how this yeah if you keep about? keep that on screen um it's a fabulous picture um, i do explain why i asked rob to let me use that picture as the cover of the book the, the paintings by Rob Maltby, and I've actually bought it. You can't see it from here, but it's, stood, it's uh, hanging on the wall in my office behind me. 
Uh, Rob Maltby is uh, a name that some of you may have heard. Um, he His girlfriend is probably slightly better known. Her name was Sophie Lancaster. And uh, Rob and Sophie were attacked in a park in Baycup um, some years back. And uh, just for ha having chosen a goth lifestyle and a gang of uh, youths uh, basically were attacking Rob, Sophie came to intervene and they, they killed her, basically. Um, I worked with Sophie's mum, Sylvia, um, for a, a number of years on uh, raising awareness, particularly among um, young people, but at band concerts and, uh, and, and that kind of thing. And um, I never actually, I just, in fact, to be honest, I've still not met Rob, um, but it, Rob kind of faded into the background, but I could never let go of him. Um, knowing what he'd been through. And so this picture for me, this is not Rob's interpretation, by the way. Uh, an artist has often has no idea um, why they've created a particular piece. But th th what this piece says to me is the Robin, as I often hear when I'm visiting grieving families, is a symbol of a visitor from the afterlife or even uh, the, the you know something that carries the soul of a deceased loved one that's coming to tell you I'm okay, I'm okay. So um, the picture, as you can see, is of a robin, and then you've got these roots, these plant roots uh, going into clearly what is a human soul. And I think for me, it spoke volumes of the connection between someone, it could be, for example, a soldier uh, who's lost a, uh, a, you know, a comrade in battle um, who will forever be connected to them because, um, so there's this sense that the the one who has ascended, for a better way of putting it, and I don't mean that in a religious way, but the one who has ascended is still connected to the one who is grounded Um and the robin looks a little, to me, like, um, or, or the bottom part of it looks like the skin of an onion, um, which obviously has an association with tears and the many layers of things. And if there's the eye of the person looking out, um, as, as you can see there. And then the sun in the background, almost like a halo. So it, it's almost saying that this is a divine relationship because the halo um, is behind the head of the grounded person and the robbing. Um, so it, it spoke lots to me about the, the ongoing connection between Rob and a trauma that he experienced. But he's moving on, you know, it's, he's not rooted in that, you know, that trauma doesn't define him. Um, uh, the, the, I mean, he, his story is his story to tell. And it's, it, there's a lot of good things going on in his life now. And his artwork is uh, tremendous. But I just, I, I told him exactly how I saw it. Uh, he was happy uh, for me to use the uh, cover, the, the piece for the cover of the book. And uh, I know his way of viewing it will be different. And it might well be that all of your ways of viewing that particular piece of art uh, is different. Um, it's it, That's what art does, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it is a particularly eye-catching image and it's a, you know, it's great that you've been able to to interpret it in the way you have. And and that's, you know, part of the, the start of the book is that explanation that you've, you've just given really of yeah. what the image means to you. And, and as you say, it can be interpreted differently. Um, but one of the key words you, you mentioned was connections. And, you know, I guess in life, you know, some connections are, are maybe more favourable than others. Um, yeah. and, and I know we, we discussed beforehand uh, someone whose name you perhaps wouldn't have wanted to be connected to and, and you, you don't want it to dominate your story. Um, but we, we, we probably can't, you know, miss that name out on this tour. No. And, that, and that's Ian Brady. 
Yeah. Um, so do you want to kind of give a flavour for your, your experience uh, around that with Ian? Well, to be honest, <laughs> and, and obviously this is going out to a wider audience, I don't want to say too much about the experience because I want people to read the book. <laughs> um, but I will say Brady never touched me physically. Um, he did try to entice me to go with him. Um, the it, that impacted me, but what really, really impacted me was later on, and I can't, you know, I don't know exactly how much later on when the Moors murders came into the public domain. I and again in the book it explains how it, uh, I became aware of who he was and what he did done and what he'd intended to do to me. So the, 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 that part of the book, and there are little stories from my childhood unrelated to that, that explain how a child growing up in that particular you know, 1950s and that particular kind of community uh, would kind of interpret the, um, the experience. Um, and for 10 long years, I couldn't speak about it to anybody. So anyone looking at my, how it impacted me, again, you know, um, as is often seen in children who are acting out, people going, oh, what, what a, a horrible kid, or soldiers with um, post-traumatic stress, uh, all they can see is the anger uh, or whatever, however it's manifested. Um and and I could so that so I was viewed um uh, in a, a given way um uh, for a long time until for one of them I don't wanna I don't wanna swear on but I'd work until I'd worked out my grit <laughs> um uh, which again is explained in the book that the the journey from total confusion, bewilderment agony to um, realising how um, it had all originated, getting rid of it. The, that's the real um, kind of story of uh, how it impacted. Because then it goes, it, that then you pass the baton on to others who have also been through some kind of traumatic experience and are coming out the other end. Um, and often, if you're, because of the insights you have from your own trauma, you can often um, help other people. Not You can't explain what's going on for them. You don't know what's going on for them often. But what you can do is create... Um, a place where they're able to move on, um, if that makes sense. So, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and and you mentioned, obviously, that it did take quite a long time for you to to be able to to start to, to speak to, to people or, or someone about, about your experiences. And so what was the kind of the turning point for you um, that allowed you to make that transition? Well, um, I, again, um, much much of it's in the book. But what I I I, I kind of left school at the age of fourteen, and and I, and I'm very very conscious that this may be uh, you know viewed by uh, young people who are in a very dark place as I was back then. Not for for obviously for different reasons, and could be all sorts of reasons, but. Um, I realised that my life was in, in a cul-de-sac um, and I was working in a factory. Um, it was low pay and I thought, you're never going to um, be able to have a life. You're never going to be able to ha raise a family. Uh, you've you've, you've got to do something. But I'd always been... <sighs> I'd always believed that I was stupid. And it was partly because one of the things that we haven't touched on 
is the fact that um, in later life, uh, I realized um, I've got Asperger's syndrome, so I'm on the autistic spectrum. Um, I didn't know that. Um, and um, what was happening was that educators and others were just seeing this unruly kid. I was getting frustrated. For, I mean, you know, Chad's a teacher, and there are others who were out there as, who were teachers uh, um, or lecturers. Um, and I know how much uh, empathy uh, people like that put into the young people they're working with. Um, but there was little understanding of Asperger's then. So long and short of it is a grown up thinking it was stupid for the wrong reasons. Um, Realised one day, I thought, oh, well, you know, it can't be that stupid. You can read, you can write. What can I do? I know, and it, again, in the book, it explains a very kind of uh, dealing with my own inner darkness and what have you to work out how can I get out of this pit? Um, and what I eventually did was realise that if I had, had access to books, I would be able to learn anything that I put my mind to and I could work out what would draw me forward. And the long and short of it is I ended up working in mental health. Again, that was very fortuitous because if you're a counsellor or you're a mental health worker, um, you have to work out your own stuff. You have to do um, work on, you know, your preferences, uh, your personality type, uh, any um, your character, your, you know, the whole whole rigmarole. Um, your IQ, well, when we all had to do IQ tests, the students all had to do IQ tests, and the person doing the test said, David, do you realise you've got an IQ that's uh, just a tad above Einstein? And I thought he was taking the, I really thought he was taking the proverbial, um, and then as as I gained confidence, I thought maybe he was. And I joined Mensa, uh, went through the entry exams to uh, join Mensa, and found it full of people who had ADHD, uh, dyslexia, on the autistic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so... Uh, the, the big breakthrough came, and I'll get to that, it when uh, I, I was in a lecture and the lecturer was talking about, we were doing forensics, forensic psychiatry. And the lecturer said, you've all got to read this book. And he held up the copy of Beyond Belief. And he said, this is about, and he was talking about the Moore's murders. And I stood up and said, I'm not reading that book. Um, and he was the kind of guy, I, I mean, I, I worked out retrospectively, he was a good guy. Everybody really looked up to him. But what he did when people were showing signs of resistance, stress, uh, not moving on in their personal journey, he pushed buttons and he went, he went a bit too far and told me, told us all, well, uh, next week we're going across to a certain department where you'll hear the tapes that Brady made of. The, it, 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 I don't think those tapes are available even within, I mean, there must be to some forensic people studying forensic, but hey. Uh, but I think he was just pushing buttons. But very luckily at that point, the the faculty leader of the the school came in with some books to put away, and she immediately read the whole room. She came across to my desk, put the books on my desk, distracted people like a really good magician, <laughs> and then said, "Oh, David, I brought the wrong books. Do you think you could carry them through to my office?" And I went with her, and for some reason. Um, you know, everything spilled out. And I offered to resign. And she said, um, don't you dare resign. 
this profession needs people with your insight who can work through your own stuff and help others work through theirs. You'll have an empathy that many of us will envy. Stay. And uh, uh, of the 20 students who started with me, four of us finished. And I was very, very glad that I did. But it was her who tipped the balance and uh, gave me the confidence to continue in the very disjointed career that followed. <laughs> uh, but it was uh, it was quite a moment. Yeah, and a moment. Obviously, you've you've covered so much there in in that answer, and um, something you touched on was obviously when you when you found out that you had Aspergis and and you were an athlete. Yeah. And you know, what would you say to someone who you know had found out you know been diagnosed with Aspergis? Would you have any kind of advice, etc.? Well, I've found out a lot more about it. Oh, all sorts of things. I've also got celiac disease, and I, I've discovered the correlation, or, and others with celiac disease have discovered the correlation between uh, abnormalities in the gut of a, a growing child and Asperger's. Um, so uh, there are all sorts of other uh, things that come out of it. But I don't know whether you know, Ashley, I didn't know this until very recently. Um, Asperger's was defined by a doctor who worked on the Nazi euthanasia programme. And uh, he was looking for ways to define people that the... Uh, the exterminators could rid society of the burdens, as it were. So I, I mean, it's a bit complicated this, but I've I've done a lot of work with uh, the late and wonderful Henry Hockland on um, generational trauma, and we did a lot of uh, stuff based on uh, the Windermere boys, the kindergarten children who'd escaped the Nazis, came to the Lake District, were supported and, and given lots of therapy. And we w had access to the notes of the therapists. Um, and, and, and anyway, that, go, that moved on. Their research moved on into subsequent, you know, their, when they grew up and their families and the tensions that that passed on um, to their children and so on. So the reason I'm going into all of that is I would say to uh, someone with, a, a young person with Asperger's now, it starts in a very dark place um, and it, an attempt to deny your fullness, your wholeness, your worthiness as a human being. However, um, don't ever believe that the, the Nazi take was right. It was clearly wrong. Um, and when you flip that coin, what you discover is that rather than it be a problem, because you are a difficult person uh, for an educator, you don't sit there, you don't, you know, just listen. Um, it's not a problem. It's your superpower. And I often say to you, I go into schools, I've not done it for a long time, but I, I, in the past I've gone into schools where teachers were pulling their hair out. Uh, kids were very challenging. And basically I've sat down and I've done very simple things, <laughs> teaching, teaching the teachers, the kids, the dinner ladies, everyone in the school in a big circle, how to make a chicken out of a, super, uh, out of a tea towel. Um, and it's, and, and the, the, the motivation being you'll be the only school in Greater Manchester or in Yorkshire or in wherever who, where everyone in the school can make a chicken out of a tea towel. But here's the thing. Some of you know how to do it already. Some of you will learn it quickly. Some of you will need support. Between you, once you've worked out how to do it, help the nearest person who's struggling to find, you know, and slowly you, you find the teachers struggling, the kids helping them and, and so on. 
And then once that had all been done, and this kind of there's a subliminal message in all of that, uh, as I'm sure you'll pick up. Once you, you once that's been done, you can actually say to the kids something along the lines of sit with someone you love and trust and watch the X-Men. Watch what is going on for those who uh, are considered mutants and how society in the storyline, it's fiction, how society is reacting. And then realise that actually what you've got is a superpower. And those people who see you as a problem need your superpower and you will help them as you go through life and it it's just um all i mean schools where i've done those kind of workshops and i've done interfaith workshops and other things with them with rabbis and imams and you know other colleagues um have gone on to be, achieve greater things as a, a school community um so uh that's that that's the kind of thing that I say to young people who, who were recently diagnosed with it. Well, I certainly didn't know the the connection uh, with the Nazis for one, and uh, and and how you kind of dovetailed onto uh, onto the X Men from that was uh, yeah, it was quite a journey. Um, That's what we do. We see the connection of everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. Um, taking you then back to kind of your younger years and. You know, in the in the book, your your experience in in care, um, and how yeah. your your journey from being in care to to working in care. What can you say about that? Right. Well, right at the uh, at the beginning, my little sister Titch and I went into care as very small children, toddlers, uh, because mum, I, I I think uh, I, I, we were obviously told a great deal at the time but I think mum had had a miscarriage and uh, she needed some and my dad was in the navy so he was at sea so we went into care so that was my beginning and that was and, and that was uh, I, I remember that's where I, I learned to like marmalade <laughs> um, so um, I went into care later after Brady because I'd become such a toxic child. I was considered beyond parental control. Um, I'd run away. I was I was uh, sleeping rough. Um, I couldn't cope. There was a primal scream going on um, inside me. I, and it was actually, you know, an audible uh, primal scream. Uh, which Chad, I think you've heard sometimes, is a great, great asset for a, someone uh, in a punk band. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I ended up in care. My experience in care is outlined in the book. There's some positive experience and there's some very negative experience. The negative experience, uh, I was too young to fully understand what was going on. Um, with not just with for me it was actually what was happening to the children around me but one of the things i learned very early was um the moment you enter the care system remember kids in the care system in victorian england were whizzed out to clean chimneys to go under uh, dangerous machines in the mills uh, they were treated like fodder. They were less than uh, human. And, and, uh, and, and an element of that has carried forward, to be fair. Um, so what I learned was I was the demon child. Uh, there wasn't, I wasn't a child who was uh, ventilating because of something that had happened to me. Nobody was looking at that. I was just, I was just a really bad kid. So when I went into the care system, there was no which way I was going to be re responding to the kid who was reacting up as you're the bad kid. Um, 
So one, I, I can give you an example. I can't. I don't think it's in the book, and uh, I can't remember. But I don't think it is. Um, I came out of the office one day in uh, a, a, a placement that was in, and uh, a young lad come running down the stairs, absolutely terrified, just as I turned into the stairwell, and coming after him was an, another lad with a knife, hell bent on killing him. And I just stepped up to him. Uh, and I didn't confront him. I didn't even look at him. I pretended he was looking at papers in my hand. And uh, he said, get out of my way. I'm going to kill him. And I've just put my foot on the next step and stepped up. And he stepped back. The knife was just touching me. And he said, I'll kill you if you don't get out of the way. And there's nothing you can do. Because if you try to hurt me, you lose your job. And I thought, bloody hell, do you really think that? And I said to him, listen, if you think losing my job is more important to me than understanding why a decent lad like you is trying to kill another lad who you, I know you normally get on with and you don't know me. And I stepped up and he just flopped on the stairs, threw his arms around me, dropped the knife, and I had not and tears all over me, and all his guns came out. Um, and later on that evening, um, he and the other lad, we, we were playing blockbusters, if anyone remembers it, with the group of young people. And uh, the, the whole, th the, the boil had been lanced, for want of a better way of putting it. But years later, that lad came to me, long after I'd left the, uh, social work, um, and asked me to christen his child. Uh, I've since done funerals for members of his family. Um, I don't see him a great deal. But from time to time, uh, when he needs someone who does what I do now, he'll come to me. Um, and I think that's the difference um, the wisdom of the day was you lock yourself in the office and you phone the police. What does that do? Um, it just criminalises a kid. And I used to say to kids who were acting up, um, they were trying to int intimidate me and I'd say, look, sit down. If you knew me when I was your age, I'd have scared you witless. Let's have a chat. And it's just that difference of not running away from tiptoeing around or whatever. Um, I mean, I could go on about uh, the, uh, <laughs> the tension. My colleagues thought I was totally off. Um, the, you know, I was totally unprofessional. Uh, they tell me my uh, practice stank. And then one day, and I've got to tell you this, it's not in the book, but one day, it might be in the next one, actually, uh, um, we all got asked to go on a course at the training centre. And the course we knew was going to be put on by young people who'd been in the care system. And when we got there, all the young people who were presenters, who were now kind of, I'd known them when they were at 16 to 18, whatever, we're now in the 20s, we're young people who've been my clients. And the first thing they did was ask everyone to go and work out where are their clients, their current clients, where are they now? And when we came back into group and people were feeding back in custody, homeless, in rehabilitation, in a hostel, and worst of all, I don't know. This, I went to give my feedback and they said, hang on a minute, you. Sit back and shut up. And I thought, what have I done? <laughs> and I, all, the, all my colleagues were going, he's in for it now. He's really bloody in for it. And they then introduced themselves and the introduction went along the lines of, I'm Joe, I'm a mechanic. So you know that I'm running the uh, the garage up the A6. You sometimes bring your vehicle in. Um, 
my name's Judy. I, I'm an, uh, training as a nurse. I'm, you know, I've bought my own house. I've done this. And then they all said, you probably don't know, but we're all his clients or ex-clients. And we hated that <laughs> because he wouldn't buy sections. He wouldn't get Section 17 money to buy us new trainers on demand. He'd say, why don't you get a job? And buy them for yourself. You'll be more, you'll be prouder. Um, he wouldn't recommend us for uh, a flat and, until we'd convinced him we could be reasonable tenants and neighbours. Um, he helped us to think about going to college and university rather than um, just getting into work and, and so on and so on. Um, and it meant a lot to me that because when you're surrounded by other colleagues who think that you're not right, <laughs> for a better word, uh, and you believe that what you're doing is the only way to do it, uh, or the right way to do it, um, then um, it's pretty powerful when the young people you've supported just affirm it in such a very adult and constructive That's way exactly that led to changes in the care system, helped um, thinking around the fullness of the Children Act and, um, you know, the empowerment of young people leaving care and, you know, a bit like the, um, the, old, the I, oh, what's it called? The, the, the Veterans Charter. Ashley, help me out. <laughs> um, for soldiers, there's now a proactive agreement in many authorities that young people who've been in the care of that authority should be prioritised for things like housing, employment within the local authority, um, encouraged to become the best they can. It doesn't work everywhere, but at least somewhere, uh, that kind of thinking is going on. Yay. Well, what you just described there made me think of uh, Nicholas Winton and uh, his kind of, he, this is your life moment of when the audience all stand up and all of that. So it must have been quite a... quite. A well, thing. I'm not a Nicholas Winton by any means. Whoa, that guy was a hero. I'll never be a hero. <laughs> well, you, you're having a good crack at it, that's for sure. Um so Patrick... I don't do drugs, Ashley. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll blur that out of the uh, the recording. No, um... don't. It's uh, let's be honest. It's <laughs> excuse me. So perhaps a, a moment where you you might have been considered a, a bit of a hero was um, during the Strange Ways prison riot, which um, which is covered in the book. How how did you get caught up in uh, all of that? Oh God, by me, that's a. Well, obviously, I was the founding director of LifeShare. We were an outreach charity working on the streets, and we were very much aware that there were people surrounding the prison who were traumatised. So to uh, on day two of uh, the crisis, we went to see if there was anything we could do. And I remember there was, there was a young mum with a baby in a trolley and and there was no the baby wasn't well wrapped and I could see she was traumatized but she loved that kid and I remember I had a, a, a big woolly cardigan on so I took it off and wrapped, wrapped it round baby in the trolley and I said what's going on and she said well there's, they've said that there's some dead and I can't see mine and she because she couldn't see her boyfriend on the roof of the prison, she assumed he must be among the dead because she couldn't find him in, uh, you know, she went to uh, ask probation who were uh, trying to connect people with those impacted. And just as I was uh, moving away saying something's got to be done, Farida Anderson appeared out of the dark. Farida was the founder of Partners of Prisons Support Group. And she was heavily pregnant. In fact, she had a baby the next day. And she said something along the lines of, oh, David, thank God you're here. I'm not going to be able to pull this together in my condition. 
take it on. Tomorrow, I want you to be at there, meet these people. Do, do, do. So um, I, I thought to myself, I need a building close to the prison. Um, I phoned the Bishop of Salford, the Catholic Bishop, and said, look, you've got loads of buildings. I phoned the Bishop of Manchester, said the same. I said, this is the situation. I need a building close to the prison where we can uh, bring these stressed people and begin to work on whatever issues are going on. Bishop of Manchester came up with a church not far from the prison, which became the Stranger Ways Crisis Centre. Uh, how I got um, into the negotiating side, well, <laughs> I knew I needed to speak to Silver Control, which is the police on the ground. Gold Control is usually in the police station or wherever. Silver Control's the, the operations unit on the ground. And then there's bronze, which is, you know, the rest of the deploy. So I thought, well, how am I going to find silver control? It won't be as ob that obvious in a situation like this. So I thought, just walk around. Some, you'll find a clue. And I spotted a bobby stood at the uh, the end of a, an alleyway. And I thought, he's not stood there for no reason. So my initials, actually, are DC Gray. So, which is where my other writing pseudonym comes from, David C. Gray. Um, so I showed him my library card, which said D.C. Gray. He saluted me. Let me go up the alley to Silver Control. As I was getting, going up, it was in a caravan, uh, you know, one of these operational things they do. And as I was going up the steps, uh, uh, an officer opened the door. Oh, what are you doing here? You're trying to, and I said, well, actually... I'm trying to get into the prison uh, on behalf of Partners of Prisoners Support Group and Life Share to see if there's anything we can do. And he was saying, oh, hey, don't be stupid, get out of here. When a voice inside, his superior said, that's David Gray. <laughs> Take him to the control room and find a way, because I don't know what that guy does, but he'll be useful in this situation. And the reason he said that was I'd once happened upon uh, a guy on the roof of a big store in Manchester who was threatening to jump, and uh, the police had been terrified of losing him. Uh, they were all over the place, but it was me who finally talked him down. And uh, so he knew I had some skills, obviously, from mental health training and one thing and another. So that's how I got in. Um but then what we when we spoke to probation and the other partners, what we found was that the the prisoners who were being bussed out were changing the names and numbers to confuse the authorities, you know, uh, not realizing that the impact on their own families was absolutely traumatic. Because the, while the authorities didn't know who was where. And we're trying to piece it together through intelligence. Um, the families were, I can't see him, so he must be among the dead. Now, you probably know there were there were no dead. The, the evening news had run a front page, 20 dead. The, the, the rumour came because the prisoners involved in the riot had used resuscitation dummies, tailor shop dummies, etc., to knowing that fibre optics was the best option then available in 1990. Uh, so fibre optic cameras push through holes in walls. Um, and what the the illusion was in the blurry images that there were these bodies all over the place and they were counting the resuscitation dummies. And the, anyway, so that's how I got involved in it. And... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, again, there's stuff in the book about it, um, but uh, we were told we weren't allowed to speak about it for 30 years, but wait, we're way over that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It should, should be safe. Um, you mentioned, obviously, life share. So so how, how did that come about? What was the kind of motivation behind setting that up? Um, oh, again, it's a long answer, and I'm sorry about that, everybody. Is anyone losing the will to live? <laughs> <laughs> Just wave, let me know you're still alive. <laughs> um, 
and it really began as a kid because um, there are stories of, you know, my granddad who had fought in the Boer War, then in the First World War. Um, guy I really, really, really looked up to. And, and just, uh, you know, a wonderful working class fella. Um, I, I give him some bloody jip, let me tell you. But, um, you know, but that's, that's also, as I say in the book. But um, I remember him coming home uh, occasionally. He'd usually come in and, you know, sit in the chair, uh, take his boots off. I'd probably be making the fire and Gran would be cooking the tea. And uh, just occasionally he'd say something like, I peeled another poor bastard off the kiln today, Chris. And I didn't know what he meant. And I'd asked me mum and dad, and eventually I was told that what he was talking about was some of the veterans, the First World War veterans, who'd become homeless, were sleeping with the backs to the brick kiln where he worked in the brickyard near Strangeways Prison, as it happens. And, of course, in the night, the, the kiln would cool down on a cold night and uh, they'd die of hypothermia. They'd just be found frozen, stuck to... Uh... And there was a Salvation Army at the bottom of the street. And again, the story of that is in the book. That's about, uh, you know, tramps. They called themselves that. They were very proud of the name. Who would knock on your door with a little tin of Airfix paint and a brush and offer to paint your door numbers for a couple of coppers, by the time they got to the end of the street, hopefully they'd have enough to get a bed for the night or to get the ticket into the big Salvation Army hospital, which was, again, near Strangeways Prison. Um, the coincidences around that prison are phenomenal. Um, years later, when I was restoring God Monastery, or on the team that was restoring God Monastery, uh, I, I discovered uh, when a prison governor I knew um, turned up, uh, to one of my talks and said, did you know, lad? Strangeways Prison and the Monastery were built at the same time using the same bricks from the same brickyard. Brickyard my granddad worked in. You know, it's one of them. Two big communities, but for very different reasons. Um, so all that experience kind of carried forward over my life. Uh, but the be big kind of catalyst uh, was when having finished my training in mental health i went to work with uh great apes at bellevue zoo again that's another story um and then the zoo the zoo closed and i became a gardener and then i i got a job as the pest control officer for the city center of manchester and while i was walking around the city i was seeing guys that I'd known in when I worked in the big psychiatric hospital, who was sleeping in doorways, in railway arches. I don't say what the, and it was Thatcher's care in the community, and the act, the real behind all the rhetoric, what was happening to a lot of people was that they were ending up on the streets. So um, they were closing the big institutions. Patients were being pushed into hostels and the hostels were, oh, yeah, we can help. We love everyone. We'll help them, bring them in. And they had no concept of the needs of some of these people. I mean, one instant I remember, I, I started to work in a hostel uh, run by the Catholic Church uh, to try and get more insights into what was going on. And I just remember one incident where a guy who I knew uh, was suffering from schizophrenia, but there was no professional experience to encourage him to manage his condition. Um, so he, he, he was not taking his medication, for example. There was no counselling. There was nothing going on for him. Um one day, um, he, he stormed into the TV room, picked up the statue 
of uh, the Virgin Mary and flunk it through a, a th third floor window. And all I remember was these nuns going, he's thrown the Virgin through the window. Um, and, and he was evicted from the hostel. So I thought, hang on, what's going on here? So I went to find him and slowly uh, it, I realised that there needed to be an outreach that was um, finding finding these people, getting alongside them. Um, and, and I think the important thing for me was listening to them, not assuming, you know, people had assumed, oh, he's like this because he's father's away. He's got no father figure when I was a kid. Not assuming what's going on for you, but waiting and listening and nurturing. And we were doing all sorts of things. We were cutting people's uh, talk. Do you know, I'd, I'd never understood that if people don't cut the toenails over a very long length of time, they eventually get pushed round through wearing shoes and become hooves under the feet. And we were soaking people's feet in the bus station in inside of it. And, um, you know, till it the, 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 the skin was soft enough and the nails were, you know, we're, we were able to tease the nails away and trim them. And we were constantly asking, we need people to come and see what's going on here, how human beings are ending up. Anyway, so we set up life share. Yeah. Um, the interesting th thing from a military point of view is that we came across, uh, I guess, about 80 uh, World War II veterans. Now, I was born eight years after the end of World War II. Um, so these guys, I was, I think it was about 30. So they'd been on the streets for the best part of 40 years. But because, but, but they were able to support each other. They were able to uh, take pride in themselves because there were places they could go and get a shower. One of them had joined a choir at the big church near the university. Uh, and he, he used to get a shower in the church and everything. And, and nobody knew because, again, there were places where people could get uh, fresh clothes and so on and so on. So you could, there was a period, and and Jackie, you might, you might um, particularly, I mean, you've read you've read the book, so I know you know. Um, there was a period when uh, people in the, the the what was then the Dole office would they uh, they would go for the, what was then no fixed abode allowance, and they'd be turned away. They'd say, "Oh, you can't be homeless. You look too smart. You're clean shaven. You you know," um, and. Um, it took a, a, a lot of work uh, from LifeShare's point of view to, to, to break that uh, kind of assumptiveness down. Because what we were saying to them is, look, you were promised a land fit for heroes. You've been let down. You're entitled to no fixed abode allowance. Claim it. Use it to seed your future to find somewhere to live etc and after two years of this approach there were only six of those guys who were still homeless one guy had started a taxi firm and was employing four others <laughs> um and he'd got himself somewhere and and so on and it was because no one had sat and listened to the bloody stories no one had um, ask them, you know, what's going on for you, pal? You're a human being. I see you. Do you know? And and so, um, again, it was a major shift. And we actually believed at the end of year two that we'd soon be able to uh, shut up shop and, and go, oh, job done. Because um, the last thing a charity wants to do is perpetuate the problem it's gone to try and meet. Um, so, um, unfortunately, um, it didn't happen because a lot of, 
I, I don't want to be political, but there's no way of avoiding it. A lot of the then Tory government's policies were impacting the poorest, the most vulnerable, the, the, the mentally ill, the p- people with learning difficulties, uh, et cetera, et cetera, with, I mean, people like Esther Ranson, who I had the good fortune of meeting and working on projects with, did um, that, w- that were wonderful things around uh, the, what I thought of as an apartheid rule, that you can't stay for more than two weeks in a given place unless you've found a job there, you've got to move on. What sort of thing, you know? So the floodgates opened in the 80s and uh, we were seeing homeless children. We were seeing uh, a a lot more homeless women. We were seeing, uh, there were occasions when you'd see patterns and you'd think, where's that come from? And, you know, for example, I remember a period of about a fortnight when we were seeing a lot of deaf people. And I don't know, you know, what was going on behind the scenes. You can only guess that. But, um, I mean, the other one, Norm, uh, uh, tell me to shut up if you want to, but who remembers Norman Tebbits on your mic? Yep. And what, what Norm, Norman Tebbit, Tory politician, says to people, look, if you, if you can't get a job, if you've been made redundant, get on your bike and go and find a place to live. Now, the impact on the middle classes of that was phenomenal. And and this isn't in the book, but I'm going to tell you the story because it isn't in the book. Okay, so um, people who uh, had previously looked down on the homeless, it's not their fault, poor, the you know, useless, whatever, whatever, lazy markets, and you know, um, would be made redundant, and they they internalised their story, and I, as I'd internalised mine from a very different kind of perspective as well this must be my fault i will go i've got some money because i've got redundancy money i will take a portion of that and i will go and get myself a job i'll get on my bike or on the bus or on the train or whatever i'll get myself a job and i won't come home until i can get my family back into the conditions that they are used to and I mean, j- just one story out of all of that. I remember getting uh, a telephone call from a, a young woman in Bristol. And she said, I hope you don't mind uh, me ringing you, but I understand that your project is working amongst uh, the homeless, etc., in Manchester. And I said, yeah, what, what, how, how can I help? And she said, well, look, me dad... He's done all that, you know, he was he, he was in a good job, he was made redundant, and he left a note saying he wasn't going to come home until he could get us back to the lifestyle we were used to. Uh, but to be honest, we don't care about that bloody lifestyle. We want my dad back. We want, we want to know that he's all right. So I said, so tell me as much as you can about your dad. So she told me, the reason I'm ringing you is he went to university in Manchester. Um, I said, well, what, what did he study? She said, oh, 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 you know, I can't remember exactly, but she, I said, what was he interested in? Oh, music. He loved music. I said, well, look, I can't promise you anything, but I'll, I'll keep my eye out. And she described him to me. We didn't have mobile phones in those days or anything like that. We couldn't send photographs, you know, electronically. But she described it that well. Saul so went into Central Library because <laughs> a lot of homeless people, and, and some of you will remember this in the eighties, uh, they used to they used to sit, or not just homeless people, pensioners used to come and sit in the Armdale all day, sat with their handbags on the lap, chatting away to the neighbours because it was it was cheaper to come in on the bus, sit in the warm Armdale centre. Watch telly on the, the in the TV shop window or whatever. Do a bit of shopping uh, than it was to heat their own homes. So that's that. But in this man's case, uh, I knew a lot of homeless people uh, didn't sleep at night. This 
they try to get into places where they would blend into the background and fall asleep with the book in front of them in the library, for example. So I go into the library and I see this guy in the music section. <laughs> and I must have put the breeze up in. Uh, I just sat down next to him and said, uh, you wouldn't have to be Lucy's lad, by, uh, dad by any chance. And he went, how do you know? And we were able to have a conversation. And I said to him, look, your family would rather that they knew you were safe with them. You've not let them down. It's not your fault. Will you go home? He said, I don't know how. I said, well, let's start with the phone call. So he went to a call box. We rang his daughter. I said, hey, up, there's someone who wants to speak to you. And there were magical moments like that. Quite a lot. Anyway, long and short of it is, um, she came, she drove up. Uh, we, we sat in a cafe for hours. <laughs> Uh, and then she drove up and uh, picked her dad up and, uh, you know, basically I just said to him as you're going, look, get yourself whatever benefits the system will give you. Do as much as you can for your family and build on that. And if you ever get a job, you know, uh, who, who knows? And I got a call uh, a while later saying he's doing all right. He's now working. It wasn't the kind of high powered job he had. He's now working and we've we've kind of downsized. We've gone from being a four car family to <laughs> a one car family kind of thing. And uh so um yeah, so so it you never know who um uh, is can be affected by homelessness. I can tell you another story kind of brings that home, which isn't in the book, I don't think. No, it's not. But what what do you want? Put your hands up if you want to wait. Story. They don't. <laughs> right. Oh, hang on, they've gone up now. Oh, that Jackie <laughs> does. <laughs> I'm watching you. <laughs> um, so there was one, th one of the things I was doing, um, I, I worked at... I worked at, I didn't work at, I volunteered at Piccadilly Radio back in the day. Um, and long and short of it is, I was also doing some work with Granada TV, not work, volunteering. But it was all about um, unlocking resources for the vulnerable. So what I did at Granada TV was a programme called Scramble that used to be on. Anyone remember Scramble? Lord Wynn Stanley, um, Judy Finnegan, uh, the director of Shelter, Roy Murphy, and Martin Duffy, who was the first TV presenter who used a wheelchair. Anyway, the scramble used to come on after the Granada News. And what we'd do is we'd tell the stories of people, uh, you know, little groups, communities, whatever, who were struggling. And um, we would um, then invite uh, businesses to donate surpluses that they no longer needed that we could then use to, gen you know, generate a flow of energy. So for I, I, an example of that was um, we put out an appeal for people to rummage in your cupboards, sharp scavers. I'm all right mentioning the company. Yeah, yeah, they fine. gave us, um, I think it was a thousand calculators, which in the day were the you know the next best thing to have kind of thing. They gave us a, 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 a thousand calculators, and we said to the public, "Look in your cupboard, find packets of soup, post them to Granada TV, da 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 da, uh, and we will uh, the first thousand um, packets we open." will send to, uh, a calculator to that person. And we I remember Judy Finnegan surrounded by uh, mailbags going, wow, how do 
you do this. All we've got to do is just, you know, dip in. And we, uh, what we decided to do was pile all the letters on the floor. And and it was the biggest response at that point in time to a TV appeal. Um, and the calculators went out and we were finding packets of soup. Uh, we found, I, I mean, I sometimes go apocryphal. We found a Roman soldier's uh, ration pack. No, we didn't. But um, there was, so we were using the soup as the tool of outreach um, for the homeless outreach project. And so on. Um, anyway, so one evening after we'd done a scramble program, we went into the, I can't remember the bar, but some of you will know it, at Granada TV, there was a pub nearby where everybody went in, the staff, the, the cast of Connor and all that, after the, they'd finished. And uh, me and some of the team went in, and it just happened that uh, George Harrison had been on the news earlier. Uh, anyway, we we had the conversation about, uh, are you going to do anything about um, the famine in Africa, you know, along the the, family, the Bangladesh lines. And George said, uh, I think you'll find that another musician's got that one in hand. And of course, as it emerged, it was Bob Geldof and Live Aid and all that. But around the table, there was this guy who was blinged with gold. And he kept saying to me, you're all right, David, do you want a drink? And... Uh, and I thought, he's, he's talking to me if he knows me. And he was a he was a TV producer, program producer. And I, I said, uh, yeah, you know, all right. So we were chatting all evening. And then he said to me as we were we were uh, getting ready to go, do you want to lift home, David? Do you still live in Blakely? And I said, yeah, how do you know? He says, you don't remember me, do you? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, we got in this I don't, I can't, I, I don't recognize cars because they have got personalities, but it was something like a Rolls or a Mercedes. It was a bloody posh car. And uh, he was driving me, driving me on. He said to me, You don't remember me at all. You snub me a little. I'm an, I'm an alcoholic, he said. And uh, basically, you came across me one night when I was about to jump in the canal with your soup run team and you spent time with me and you talked to me and you found me somewhere to live and you sorted me out. And I didn't see you after that. And I said, well, you look bloody different. I remember that night, but by crikey, you do look different. He says, well, you know, I was in a bad place. I was in a dark place. He said, but once you get yourself sorted in this business, you can make your money pretty quickly. And you know, I've uh, I've come back up again now. And I've not I've I've been dry now for X and all that. And I said, well, well. And and as I was getting out the car, he said, David, don't you ever ever forget, you snobby bugger, that that thing about not judging others and not assuming that because someone's uh, well off now or you know uh, that they haven't been there. Uh, Promise me. And I said, all right, lad. And it was a big lesson, frankly. It was a big lesson. Um, anyway, there you go. I'll shut up. <laughs> well, I'm very conscious of time. So I think it's about time we kind of give give the audience some uh, question, uh, opportunity to ask some questions of their own, if, if they've got any. Uh, so if, if you'd like to, uh, just unmute yourself and, um, you know, fire away. Not like you lot, to be shy. Oh. Actually, I can think of a question. <laughs> I've got one. Oh, yeah, sorry, Jack. You go first. Oh, right, you who's, go go, first. who's going go on, first? Jackie, Jackie okay. go on. Okay, thanks. Um, you mentioned about it's important to listen. Where have you gone? <laughs> All right, do you keep talking? I can hear you. I just can't uh, see your face on the screen. Oh, there you are. It's important to listen to people. Mm -hmm. um, but did you come across anyone that you found difficult to listen to? Or who they also found it was difficult to explain how they were feeling and how do you overcome that do you have to keep just going back to that person and, and persist or well to be honest jackie with I, and and i think you'll get this 
the people who it was hardest to get through to were the people with power, the housing officers, the councillors, the politicians. Um, it was harder for them to hear what we were trying to tell them. And it took a long time before... Um, I mean, I, again, I think you know the story in the book of the phone call I got from uh, a psychiatrist at Presswich Hospital asking, what did you do to? Um, and it was, but the, the story's in the book. It was a woman we'd encountered who was uh, unfortunately trapped in prostitution. Um, and... Uh, the story's in the book, so I'll leave it at that. But um, what the, 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 the mental health professional was saying was, since the night she encountered your outreach team, she's not, um, she's come off drugs, she's getting her child back, she's doing, da, 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 da. she was, what on earth did you do? We've been working with her for. And um, I told, I, I said, well, you know, we saw her. Um, there was it, the, there's some detail in the book that's that's I'll pan this story out for you. Um, but then I was invited to go and speak to the uh, the whole team of professionals, and from that, some of them started to volunteer their time, and from that. Um, Manchester Action on Street Health, MASH, brilliant, um, set up uh, a kind of peripatetic mobile um, service. So they took over professionally doing the treating people's feet, uh, treating other ailments and generally looking after health and so on. And of course, HIV hit the fan. Um, and it was, it was good that by that time, um, the professionals were actually, you know, no longer walking by uh, or turning a blind eye to it, looking at it. But but I know your question's more about, um, you know, people in trauma, for, for want of a better way of putting it. Yes, there are many um, who it was uh, very difficult to uh, get through to or to work out what was going on for them and it often took time and so it was a our our continual presence um as a point of contact people who they began to get into um relationship with and people they look forward to seeing people who saw them that sometimes the floodgates would open in a single encounter sometimes it would be a year two years down the line. Um, and I can, I mean, again, there are stories in the book of, uh, I think the one of the white lady story um, is, uh, is, is one such of how the breakthrough often comes in a most unexpected way for everyone concerned. Um, so yeah, good question, Jackie. Um, it's, I mean, when you live in a neighbourhood, um, you know, people ask me, why don't you move out of God? Why don't you? No, when you live in a neighbourhood and you understand uh, there are some wonderful, wonderful people who live in this part of Manchester. Um, and there are some people um, who uh, I've, 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 I've traumatised. Um, but over time, by not judging, by building relationship, um, you can be a positive influence as a wounded healer in a community. So, for example, as, as, as you know, and you very kindly um, supported the work, there was a period when, uh, when, before Elaine and I got too old and too frail um, to continue to be on the front line, as it were, when we were running uh, a massive project growing fruit and veg for the homeless, we were rescuing chickens, we were giving about 6,000 eggs a, a year away. 
and everyone who offended in our community who uh, who wasn't given a custodial sentence, who was given a community service sentence, came through us. And I was in the chippy the other night, and a bloke come in and he went, Dave, how's your missus? Oh, by God, you. Well, I never forget them chicken and the, 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 the woman in the chippy. What what's going on? And, and uh, you know, it was what we were doing, instead of treating them as offenders, what we were doing was uh, finding out what's going on. So there was issues like dyslexia. You know, you know all the, you, you know better than I do. And um, and so it was just uh, one of those holding places. I mean, we even got a, uh, an agreement with the police. If if somebody if somebody had a warrant out for their arrest, and they came to the small holding, uh, uh, where police officers were often volunteering as well, by the way. <laughs> um, they wouldn't get arrested. And what it did, it persuaded people to take personal responsibility to go from the the the, the, the small holding, even though there was an officer there who could have arrested them, and go to a police station and hand themselves in and deal with whatever was going on. And we would support them in that. Um, and it was it was changing antisocial behaviour and criminal behaviour in the whole community. I mean, j just working with the chickens, I remember some couple of guys once talking to them. These chickens, they're us. When they're in the battery situation where they're feeling penned up and, you know, they're, they're undernourished, they're pecking at each other, they're pulling each other's feathers out. But when you bring them here and they've got all this space and they're li living in an orchard and uh, they're well fed, they 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 they, they get on. <laughs> they just they just mill around and and get on. Um, and so they were seeing parallels in um, what they were doing. And and I used to get them. They weren't just on the plot, you know, kind of digging and planting and. and moving manure around. I used to say, come on, I've got I've got a load of uh, vegetables here. I've got a second to a drop in. And so I'd take them to uh, with me and they, they'd see the kind of whole process of uh, how the community was being supported. And they felt part of that. And that was special. And it changed them from people who were working against the community to people who were working for and with the community, and uh, and I still see a lot of those people, and and I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Uh, it's just, yeah, just. I hope that answered your question to some degree. It did, and I must say that I can't look at an egg box without thinking of you, David. <laughs> Is it the air cool? <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, Jackie. Where, was it Chad who was good? Did, did you have a question, Chad? I, I did, yeah. I've got the, um, I think we all have the original version, right? This is the one. Oh, I stop! Got. Stop! Get that oh. out of the way! <laughs> <laughs> right, come on, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Well, I got I got this um, right before I was leaving to come home, so I, I had the opportunity to read it on the plane. And one of the things that I really liked about the book is that it sounds very Northern English to me, and <laughs> it is a cadence and a rhythm yeah. to it, which I really liked. But what seemed obviously, I love the stories, but what you know, what seemed to underpin everything to me was you know, I get to live in Greater Manchester for three years, Fallowfield, Didsbury. Droylsden, Newtonley Willows, Mosley. I was all over the place. And one of the things that I kind of discovered about people from Northern England was because of the weather and the, the climate that a lot of people are always managing to find light in darkness. And when they find oh, it, they well, really, absolutely. they really yeah. celebrate it. Right. Yeah. So as your book, you know, reaches a wider audience. Um, this sounds like something that you're very, very proud of. This innate ability to find light and darkness, which I find a lot of people in Northern England yeah, can, can do. Um, 
is is this is this what you want your audience to see about where you're from and does that make you proud to make other people know this well i think i don't think it's just people in the north of england who do that i mean one of the uh the communities i grew up with is a jewish community and they who's experienced the kind of darkness that they went through last century um and um and, and Jewish humour is absolutely um, part of their resilience as a people. But Ashley, Neil, you both know, and Tony um, and others out there, um, the same goes for the ex-forces community, or for the the, the, the military community uh, and, uh, and, and the ex-forces community, that there is this ability to see... Uh, some positive in whatever's going on that uh, and th that that whatever it is the grit the determination to carry on against the the, the odds um so um yeah i am proud that i'm uh from i mean you know i think i've probably said to you before chad um uh, that you travel the world um and uh, I don't, you've invited me out to Maine so many times and I'd love to, but I couldn't until I know who's going to be elected next time. Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> but um, for me, Manchester's a place that the world comes to. So we've got, uh, we've got a Chinatown, as have many American cities, uh, as have many Spanish cities. Um you know, we've got the Chinatown, the Little Italy. We've got the footprints of the the West Indian community, and and again, where music's concerned, we we've got that joy that we find in each other when we introduce each other to uh, different music, different tastes, um, and so on and so on. So I'm very very proud that I'll, uh, or very not proud's the wrong word. I think it's pleased that I live in this city, which I know you love, and which loved you back, by the way. Um, and, and when I say this city, I, I mean the Twin Cities, Manchester and Salford. Um, they, they're, they're kind of kissing cousins, and their communities are very similar and have faced, had similar narratives and histories and so on. Um, so, yeah, I'm pleased that I live here. And Bellevue, when I worked there, was another place where the animals from around the world, the music from around the world, the culture, the fun fairs, the, the whole thing um, was celebrated. Um, and so we, we're pretty good at celebrating. And of course, uh, you know, having made the analogy with military humour and fire brigade humour, Elaine used to work for the fire brigade. Uh, it, it's an essential um, way of getting on with the job, as it were, to be able to find the light in the dark. Um, but in terms of the military uh, connection, the northwest of England is the biggest recruiting ground for the British Army. So, um, you know, basically, it's in us that there's a kind of osmosis of all those flavors and elements and so on uh going on that um form our character and, and i wonder i mean the place as you know the place i feel most at peace and connected is scotland but um but manchester uh and salford um are just an amazing place to be and yeah, we need, we, as you say, and I thank you for acknowledging that we do see, uh, do have this tendency to see the light in the darkness. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you before too long. Got a new car, pal. Car broke down last time we were here. Problem. Like they told me. Anyway. <laughs> no. Anyone else? You. Sorry. I was going to say, yeah, thank you for both of those questions. I'm I'm conscious yeah. of time. Um, okay. So I think it's obviously a very rich tapestry um, of your life, David, so far. Obviously, there's still, still quite a bit to be written. 
Um, you know, who knows? Scars that let in the light might turn into a few volumes. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, obviously, I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of obviously everyone that's attended and, thank and you, people yeah, that are going to watch. Thank you, everybody. Um, people that are going to watch on demand as well as such. Um, this will be going out. So as I said at the start, if you want to watch it again or share it with friends or, or fact, you know people that you think would be interested, uh, please spread the word. Um, and yeah, thank you for obviously spending the time tonight. And um, thank you to David for such a, a rich conversation. Can I make a request? Listen, some of you have read the book. If you would, it'd be really appreciated if you'd write a review on the Amazon page uh, to give others uh, a flavour of what to expect. Because um, you all know, but people won't, that whatever my income is, it helps me to uh, plant um, seeds for others, local projects. And, you know, we plant fruit trees, for example, so that hopefully uh, future generations of kids walk into anywhere in the city, we'll be able to pick apples, pears, plums, you know, that kind of thing. And it would help all of that if the sales of the book uh, were good and strong. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, um, Ashley. Very well said. All right, well, on that note, we'll, uh, we'll call it an evening. And, uh, yeah, thank you all again, and uh, hope to see you all soon. Cheers, everyone. Ta-da! Yeah.